I see. You've found our little hiding spot in the universe. Don't get too comfortable. This is a place where you will find those with an experience that's out of this world. Or possibly deep within your life. I welcome you to the Oracles with James Tyson. Lean forward and listen. We will pull you into a supernatural journey with guests from around the world each one experiencing some of the most extraordinary phenomena this wee planet has to offer. Now, here are the Oracles with James Tyson. Thank you, Liam, and thank you, listener, for tuning in to the Oracles with James Tyson. And in this episode, I introduce you to my friend Sylvia Schultz. Now, she has been writing for years and recently made the switch from fiction to nonfiction books. And it's the nonfiction ones we're going to be talking about, uh, particularly Fractured Spirits hauntings at the peoria state hospital and i'm really glad i said peoria right because i that does not roll off the tongue well uh, also going to talk to her about her book 44 years in darkness and it's a story about rhoda Deary, a, uh, a very tormented woman who was almost rescued from one very very horrible situation in a psych hospital and placed into the Peoria State Hospital uh, for the last few years of her life and uh, had a bit of a turnaround. And we'll touch on her newest book that came out in September, Fractured Souls, kind of a continuation of the Fractured Spirits, uh, the hauntings of the Peoria State Hospital. It's very, very interesting, the things that she's up to. She is, as I say, a paranormal investigator. Has been kind of a, spent a lifetime in the pursuit of all the weird and strange, which she shares with her readers. Uh, Her fiction, uh, which is both horror and romance, is still floating around out there, but these days she concentrates on on living a childhood dream, which is telling true ghost stories. Her second nonfiction book, Fractured Spirits, The Hauntings at the Peoria State Hospitals, featured on an episode of the Sci-Fi Channel's hit show, Ghost Hunters. It is the first book to examine the famously haunted asylum from both a historical and supernatural perspective, and it was nominated for an award from the Illinois State Hospital Society. In her spare time, Sylvia gets more material for her books by going on paranormal investigation. She wanders around cemeteries and sits in haunted morgues, so um, basically you don't have to do that. So she does it, and she'll write a book about it, and you can read the book so you can stay home and not get a cold butt sitting on some slab somewhere. Uh, Very much in demand is a speaker, and if you know of somebody, and and again, she's out in the Peoria, Illinois area. If you know anybody in Illinois who's having a paranormal uh, conference or anything and wants a speaker, she's the one, or she is one of a few, but she is really, really good at kind of whipping that audience up into a frenzy. No, I'm kidding. Uh, she, 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 she is the traveling roadshow of all the Illinois haunted stuff that you would uh, want to bring up. Plus, she's interviewed enough people and experienced enough things where she actually does have a really, really good talk. Um, yeah, and, and check out her books. Again, Fractured Spirits, Hauntings of the Peoria State Hospital. And the other one we'll talk about is 45... 45, 44 years in darkness. Don't want to drag poor uh, Rhoda Deary through another year of darkness. Uh, And we'll explain what that means in darkness. And we're going to touch on her newest book, Fractured Souls. We are going to have uh, Sylvia back um, because she's written a number of books. And one of the books that I want to talk to her about is basically it's Demons and more of the dark side of paranormal investigation. So that's going to be a whole other show that we're going to end up doing, another episode that's coming out uh, in a few weeks when I drag her back kicking and screaming <laughs> back on. Uh, very, very interesting young lady. Please go to her website, Sylvia Schultz, that's S-H-U-L-T-S dot WordPress dot com. Again, Sylvia Schultz dot WordPress dot com. And I will probably mention half a dozen times that she's also has a website sylviaschultz.com go to her um, Facebook page Sylvia Schultz and check her out there very very interesting and I hope you enjoy Sylvia how are you? I am doing fantastic James how have you been? I have been doing very very well and um, just so our listener knows we've been gabbing off 
line before we started for, I don't know, half an hour or so. So <laughs> we're going <laughs> to, you and I are going to recap what we talked about, but it's been fun. Uh, like I haven't talked to you for, what is it? Four years now, almost five years. So, uh, about seems, that. Yeah. yeah it, it is good. And you had a good Christmas, you and the family. I did. I did. It was, it was a very quiet affair. It was just my husband and myself and the two dogs. But it was great. We sat and binge watched Lost in Space and had a lovely turkey breast dinner, and it was it was fun. I binge watched two seasons of uh, Jack Ryan. Oh. A lovely Christmas, <laughs> lovely Christmas uh, <laughs> event. Um, what what I'm dragging you, kicking and screaming out here on the show to today is uh, I'd love to talk to you about your book series and uh, and how you basically got into it. You've you've got a number of really good books, um, from hunting demons to fractured spirits. Um, uh, mm-hmm. What the heck? You've got uh, one of the one of the ones I was really interested in is the fractured spirits, the haunting or haunt fractured spirits hauntings at the Peoria Peoria State. See, this is where my tongue falls off, and we should start all <laughs> over again. But we're not going to <laughs> fractured spirits hauntings at the Peoria State Hospital. Then I want to talk to you, you kind of, we're going to grab that and mix it into your book, 44 Years in Darkness, which is dark in itself, in this poor story. It about is. Lady. It and is, And then yeah. getting in, into the next, uh, your newest book that came out in September, The Fractured Souls, um, kind of the continuation of Fractured Spirits. Uh, what got you into this kind of line of uh, nonfiction writing? What, what spurred your interest in this type of paranormal? Well, James, you're right. It is actually turning into a series. I had no idea that was going to happen when I started it. But, uh, yeah, um, well, I started off writing fiction, actually. I've always loved telling stories and having stories told to me and um, started writing fiction, horror and romance. I know, fine line between the two. Um but I, re- I started writing ghost stories. I was contacted by a publisher to do a book of true ghost stories. And that has been a fascination of mine since early childhood. I was raised on Grimm's fairy tales. So ghost stories are one of my obsessions. So I wrote this book of true ghost stories and it was well received. So I, I dropped the fiction for the most part, and concentrated on the true ghost stories. And while I was working on that first book, people would ask me, they knew I was a writer from way back, and they'd say, what are you working on now? And I said, well, I'm working on a book of ghost stories about the Illinois River. And they said, oh, you have to explore this haunted place. It's it's called the Peoria State Hospital. And I said, really? I, I, I didn't grow up in this area, so I knew nothing about it. And I said, well, what's that? And they said, it's a haunted, abandoned mental asylum. And my interest was immediately piqued. And I started doing the research on it. After I finished that book, started researching this abandoned mental asylum. And what I realized very, very quickly is that you say haunted mental asylum and your mind automatically goes all American horror story on you and you assume that there was pain and fear and abuse. And it is my privilege and my great deep joy to tell people that was not the case at the Peoria State Hospital. This was a place where the patients were treated like family. This was a place where they got three meals a day of locally grown food. This was a place where they were not dressed in hospital uniforms. They were allowed to wear their own clothes. This was a place that was absolutely unlike any other asylum in the world. So the history of this place is just as fascinating as the ghost stories. And I am so incredibly grateful that such a place existed so close to my house. I can go and visit it whenever I want to. And my own family tree is, is 
quite loaded with people that have mental problems. So you shake my family tree, a lot of nuts are going to fall off. <laughs> um, so to know that there was a place like this where people were helped, even though it was never members of my own family, I feel a kinship with them. Yeah, And I... that's so special to me that there was a place where people could genuinely get the help that they so desperately needed. And in the U.S. too, for my listener, it's, this wasn't um, the, what you commonly would call a, a sanitarium, uh, where um, those have been in modern times, kind of we look back at that and must said, oh, it must be a crazy hospital. Sanitariums are people where you'd go to the spa. Basically, or you're having mm-hmm. a rough, if you had a, a rough yeah. week, you could check yourself into the sanitarium. This was actually a mental hospital. This was a psychiatric hospital operated by the state, and it was from about, what, 1902 to the early 70s? 1902 to 1973, yes. Okay, so, right, my, my memory is kicking in. Um, let's just read a little <laughs> Very bit. Very good. The part. Uh, yeah, and so it it was it wasn't um, the the you know mid eighteen hundreds where they were still experimenting. It was it was nineteen o two where there was no, it wasn't that. one of those snake pit things. No, it was far from it. Yeah, it was it was um, and being run by the state, so there'd be there were um, some checks and balances. It wasn't more uh, absolutely. Yeah. Now, Dr. Zeller, Dr. George Zeller, who was the first superintendent of the asylum, he had an open door policy. First of all, he was not trained as a psychiatrist. He was trained as a surgeon, as was his father before him. They both had practices in Peoria. And Dr. Zeller was very proud of the fact that he was not hide bound by the current practices in the care of the mentally ill. He just said, let's treat them with kindness and see what happens. And what happened was that the Peoria State Hospital became the premier institution for the care of the mentally ill in the world. Um, So he he felt very strongly about non-restraint. That was one of his basic tenets is he he wrote in his autobiography that, um, you know, if you walk into a yard where there's a dog tied up and it's on a short chain and it's chained to a post in the ground, that dog's going to snap at you as you walk by. It is not going to be happy about being tied up. And he said, why would we treat human beings worse than we treat dogs? Yeah. That is not cool. It's not going to happen on my watch. Um, People would come to the asylum from other places, from almshouses and poorhouses and other asylums, and they would arrive in straitjackets. And Dr. Zeller would immediately confiscate those. He forbade the use of straitjackets, straitgowns, handcuffs, footcuffs, mittens, bed saddles, Utica cribs. He absolutely refused to use anything like that in his asylum. And the only reason he kept any of these things that he confiscated was he kept them all in a little room next to his office. And he kept them so that his staff could point to these items of torture and say, never again, not here, not at this asylum. He had an open door policy. Any reporter could walk onto the hilltop at any time of the day or night, no warning whatsoever. And Dr. Zeller had enough faith in what he was doing and how he had trained his staff that he knew he had nothing to hide. Reporters could come in at any time, look around the place, ask questions of the inmates. It didn't matter because Dr. Zeller knew that everything was on the up and up. Oh, that's perfect. And, and that would be a way not only for him Dr. Zeller to, to uh, keep his his uh, staff kind of under their own little checks and balances. But uh, if he could open it up and say, hey, buddy, anytime, not only the media could come in here and the reporters could start talking to you too. So it's not just me looking over your shoulder. It's it's the family of the patients. And it's also mm-hmm. the uh, the community itself through the media coming to look over your shoulder. So get your Absolutely. Together. 
Excellent. <laughs> he, yeah, he, I, I, he he wrote in his uh, in his rules for his staff. That was part of it. He wrote down in black and white on the page. He said, "These people have been committed here by their families, and we owe it to those people that care for our patients, who love our patients. These are their loved ones, and we have got to care for them as though they were our own loved ones, because." Every person here has a mother, a father, sisters, brothers who care very deeply at what happens to them. So we ought to give them the same care. No, oh, that's fascinating. It, it's a it, it's a good way to look at um, helping another human being. I, I get, think too they mm-hmm. they first initially built it looking like an old like um, castle. Like, like the, <laughs> yes, the old yes, prisons. I did. And then someone said, nah, that's not how we do this anymore. Turn it into more of a looking like an educational uh, facility, a university or a college. And they, they tore down the old, like the walls of the castle and turned it into something a little more soft. Yeah, that's a very good way to put that, too. The first building that was built, um, well, the, the first administration slash hospital building that was built was built after a plan called the Kirkbride plan. There was an architect in the 19th century named Thomas Kirkbride, and he designed buildings for asylum use. Um, The Kirkbride plan had its advantages, but it also had its drawbacks. Uh, The Kirkbride plan is one great big building, and you can build wings onto the ends if you need to, to expand. And that assures that every patient has a window to look out. When Kirkbride was designing his buildings, uh, asylum landscapes were being designed by people like Frederick Law Olmsted, really high up uh, people that really cared about what the patients were looking at out of those windows. Gently landscaped gardens, rolling hills, really pleasant stuff to look at. Now, the Kirkbride building, every window looked out on these beautifully landscaped, manicured gardens and whatnot. But in the Kirkbride system, you have all the patients in one building. So if you were suffering from depression, your roommate could be a raving schizophrenic, and that's not good for either one of you. Mm -hmm. Um, So it was decided to tear that Kirkbride building down, and Dr. Zeller had always pushed for the cottage system, which was uh, started in Mantino, I think, Um, Mantino, Illinois, or maybe it was Kankakee. At any rate, it was one of those, the early um, asylums that went to a cottage system. And in the cottage system, people with like ailments were housed together. Epileptics were housed with epileptics, and they were paired up in a buddy system. So if you started having a fit, help was as close as your buddy. People who suffered from alcoholism were all housed together. So if you were having a particularly bad day and wanted to find relief in the bottom of a bottle, there was always someone you could talk to who knew exactly what you were going through. And it really helped with the cure rate. Now, with the Kirkbride building at the Peoria State Hospital in 1898, it was built on unsteady ground. Um, and the fellows who had the contract to put the building up, it later came out that these were guys that had ties to the Chicago Mafia. (laughs) So they were using shoddy workmanship, shoddy construction. By the time the building was all completed, the foundation was already starting to crack. The ventilation was bad. It was just a hot mess. And nobody liked this building. Dr. Zeller said, oh, no, I'm not having any of my patients live in this building, not on on your life. So um, the the building was torn down in favor of the cottage system. Oh, nice. (laughs) It it means a lot when when the people upstream kind of um, have some empathy and understanding for um, the bigger picture of, of humanity and how to look after 
us or you know each other it uh yeah. it shows and then in history it shows uh we have a lot of um you know in hindsight i should say not in history but in hindsight we can go back and say yeah that was a good way to do it compared to you know something that happened two states over which was a complete basket case or you know and even mm -hmm. um even later mental hospitals uh, or I shouldn't say mental hospital. Yeah, I guess you could say still say mental hospital. It's uh, even ones that were you know opened up in the forties and fifties and sixties. Some of those were horrid, absolutely horrid. I, I lived not too far from yeah. my uh, psych hospital, and my cousin's wife worked there as a nurse, a psych nurse, mm. and it was <laughs> it was insane. Um, you know, but but back then, and I used to volunteer at a uh, telethon. We'd raise money. And a lot of the money would go hmm. to the kids who lived there. They had a farm. It was called Colony Farm. And they grew the food and raised the animals that fed everybody else in the other side. But even oh, looking fantastic. back to, to in the 70s when I was helping out as a kid, those kids that were there, they literally wouldn't be in, uh, in an institution nowadays. They were, mm -hmm. would be deemed autistic or somebody with Down syndrome or a birth defect. And that was Right, it. right. But they were, the parents would institutionalize them back then. And they were also mm -hmm. hanging around the, uh, with literally crazy people, people with severe mental yeah. health issues. It's one of the most haunted locations around my area. It's called Riverview outside of Vancouver, British mm -hmm. Columbia, but it was the lower... Uh, left coast of British Columbia, Canada, that was kind of the place you'd get sent to if you had a head bone problem. And uh, the mm. Crease Clinic. Um, let's see, we film, if you ever watch the TV series um, Arrow or Supergirl, yeah. anytime you see, you see a prison, that's it. Well, it's it's oh. just one big movie set right now. It's pretty well everything <laughs> that needs an old cre creepy building is filmed in Riverview. Uh, it's basically well. I'll be done. It's constantly filmed, and it is kind of funny when you talk to the people who who uh, who work there in film and uh, talk to them about their equipment and their sound equipment and things where they'd have to, uh, <laughs> you know, I, we just picked up something. Can you we'll have to do that scene over again? <laughs> What's that noise? <laughs> Wonderful. Talking? And all the the ads are walking around shushing everybody. Come on, quit talking, quit talking. And the four of us are standing there going, uh, and none of us said anything. What are you hearing? <laughs> Oh, brilliant! Talking in the background, <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, it's, it's kind of funny. Um, mm. But you know, I, I love these old places. These are, are great. And this one, um, like any other place where you've got a lot of people working together and um, and a lot of anxiety and a lot of confusion in life, um, it kind of remains. We kind of sometimes in death that stays behind which gets me to the fractured mm -hmm. spirits and hauntings at the Peoria State Hospital um yeah what once you started digging into it what did you find what did you uh what spurred you to the point where you're going to say crap i got enough here for a book <laughs> well people were very generous in sharing their stories and experiences with me um, I quickly realized that this place is so incredibly haunted, for the most part because the spirits want to be there. Um, I spoke with the historian of the place, and she had done cemetery tours. And uh, there, was, there was a fellow who was recording, and he asked Christina, you know, why is this place so haunted? Um, why, why are the spirits here? And she was just about to launch into what I've just, what we've just been talking about, about how the, the wonderful care the patients received, the, the fact that it felt like home. She was just about to launch into all of this when the guy said, you know, why are the spirits, if, if they, they got so, if they got such good care, why are the spirits still here? And before she could even answer him, a young girl's voice comes up on the recorder, and she says, they're just so nice here. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of the spirits are on the hilltop because it was sometimes the only home they'd ever known, the, the only home they were ever happy in. 
and sometimes because they just felt accepted. They felt like they were already home. So why would they want to leave afterwards? That's um, very that's very very common in hospitals and in small hmm. communities. Uh, I can where, understand that. And, yeah. And also when you get into the uh, the masons and those like um, the lodges and things like that where there's a sense of community within a community. I find a lot of hospitals, you'll get a lot of nursing staff will remain. Ah, okay. Working with the patients. And yeah, now, yeah. For, for my listener, there's a difference between, um, and, and I don't know what you, uh, what you define them as uh, or label them. There's those who've died and not crossed over. Mm-hmm. And those who mm-hmm. have died and crossed over. I always say the crossed over ones are souls and the ones who haven't are ghosts. So that's the easy. I would agree e- with that. It's just easy for my brain to, to, to separate them. So a lot of yeah. the ones who have crossed over have actually come back because yeah. they're still helping. And we get a lot of nurses that have crossed over and come back because they are, they are still in this, in the, helping mode of getting that ghost to the point where it is going to then continue and cross over. So they're helping. That sounds at, wonderful. On yeah. their side. Uh, now you've uh, like, you're, you're part of a paranormal team. Um, mm-hmm. So you're, let's say you're out there doing your investigation. Like, you know, you've, you've, you've got your, you know, you're poking around in there. What types of, um, ghost stories do you have that are first hand? Oh. Or just a couple? Throw, I know we'll be here for days. Uh, I just, after. I, after because I, I could her, talk to her. Oh my God, yeah. I just, uh, I should go for a beer now and come back and see what she said later. Uh, because, yeah. Settle in, strap it's in. It's going to be yeah. a ride. <laughs> yeah. What's some good ones? Well, uh, well, i um, as you and I were, were talking before, um, I do have a nurse from the Peoria State Hospital that shows up whenever I do a presentation about the asylum. Um, I was, I, I did a presentation for a group called um, Prairie Land Paranormal Consortium. And completely unbeknownst to me, this, uh, there were two speakers, myself and another fellow, and just by complete happenstance, um, I did my presentation on the Peoria State Hospital, and this other fellow actually spoke about um, Bookbinder, who is one of our spirits. He presented a um, he, he had done a film on Bookbinder and spoke a little bit about that, and then he also showed us the teaser trailers for a film he was working on about Rhoda Derry, who we'll be talking about a little later on in this podcast. And so this entire afternoon ended up being devoted to the Peoria State Hospital. So I had no idea this guy was going to be here. So I sat back in the audience and just enjoyed someone else talking about the asylum, my beloved asylum. And I happened to be sitting next to someone who introduced herself to me as a psychic medium. And she said, do you know that there's a nurse that stands behind you when you give your talks? I said, no, but that's awesome. (laughs) And she described this nurse to me. And she said, she wasn't able to give me a name, but she said, the nurse says that everyone on the other side is all a Twitter that they're in a book. And everyone's so proud of you for sharing their stories and getting the information out about the the good things that happened at the asylum. And I was just over the moon about this. And yeah, she 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 shows up every time I do one of my talks. And I've I've discovered that if I, I can't see her, I can't hear her. I'm not aware when she's around which breaks my heart because I'm sure she's a lovely lady. Um, And she gets irritated with me sometimes because I don't acknowledge her. And I have learned when I've been going around to 
libraries and conferences that it's always wise to tell my audience that she's there because otherwise she will interfere with the laptop and um, interfere with the slideshow <laughs> too. But if I acknowledge her right away, we have no problems with the slideshow at all. Even if it's a small library with a bulky laptop and they always have problems with other speakers, it goes off without a hitch as long as I say something about my nurse. <laughs> okay. and, and for my listener, I was looking at a picture of Sylvia and I saw a lady standing behind her, like a, a tall, slim lady with st- short, strawberry blonde hair in a long, white, like, uniform. And I didn't know about this nurse. So, but I usually only see family members behind people. And so what I'd like you to do, is, Sylvia, is if you have a psychic that you're pretty connected to, can you ask her, mm-hmm, which on I my do. behalf, mm-hmm. if that was the nurse that came through? Because, again, ah. I told you, I have never seen that in a photograph before by looking at somebody's photo mm. and seeing what I always get as a family member. I see, I saw this lady on your left side, which is my right side, looking at the photo. Okay. So, right, right. And again, a kind of a tall, slim lady, um, very, I want to say regimental. Um, uh, <laughs> matron strict kind of matron, um, matron kind of strict. Like it's very strict. Very That's like how could have she's been, a, been described to me. <laughs> like like your grade three teacher when you've done something wrong. <laughs> No, like kind of in charge, but um, yeah, that's that's who I see. So ask your psychic friend if I saw the person, and then get back I will to definitely do that. Yeah, I will that, definitely do that. What's, what's, it's, it would be really really cool because I again I've never seen it in photo before when I looked at somebody's <laughs> photo. I, I can I usually only get that in real life when the person I'm talking to in real life has some yeah. message or somebody comes through and is jumping up and down beside them saying, oh, you got to tell me about this. Um, and, and so it, it doesn't happen all the time when I look at somebody. I really have to, like, I either have to focus or it's just something that's uh, utterly um, <laughs> distracting for me when have something come through. <laughs> it's like, oh, you got to tell them about, you know, where the I've tra- been told that it's very distracting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, so definitely ask about that. So I will. Cool. I will. And I know that they now can, this, yeah. They they do disrupt things. They're they're quite quite excited <laughs> when they do that. <laughs> they they are kind of busy. Um yeah, I'd also want to know if she was actually if she had ever crossed over or she's just thinking that she should stay back. That would be interesting to find out too. That would be cool to know. Because yeah. if she did cross over after going to her like learning the stuff on the other side, when she comes back, mm-hmm. she can always come back and do what she's doing. Mm-hmm. She'd actually come back stronger. But she may not mm. know that. So, or heck, she probably does now. With all the conferences she's gone to, <laughs> pff, come on. <laughs> uh, right? Yeah, yeah no kidding. Um, do you, when you travel around to these conferences and you talk about the hospital itself, do you have anything from the hospital you bring with you? Uh. Physically? Yeah, Every rock. once in a while, I have um, the historian of the hospital has set me up with kind of a, a three-part board where you stand it up, and it's got photographs of the hospital buildings, the historical photographs and whatnot. And we do have, um, it, it's really fascinating from an archaeological standpoint because the the whole hilltop is crisscrossed with these ravines. And sometimes these ravines have running water going through them. And there's all sorts of hidden natural springs as well on the hilltop. If you go down into the basement of the Pollock Hospital, for instance, the tuberculosis ward, which is still standing, you're actually standing on three feet of a natural spring, a natural spring that's three feet deep, um, when you're standing in that basement. Um, they did that, they built that hospital over the spring on purpose because they used that part of the basement for cold storage for people that had passed away. So all of these ravines and all of these little hidden natural springs have running water 
which is a very powerful attractant of psychic energy. Yeah. So uh, when, when the hospital was closed in 1973, the state of Illinois just locked the doors and walked away. All these hospitals, these, these um, well, the hospitals too, the cottages were left as they were. Pianos stood in day rooms unplayed. There were still sheets on the bed. There were still pillowcases on the pillows. There were still dishes on the dining room tables. Everything was just left where it was. And the city of Bartonville tried and tried to repurpose these buildings because they were gorgeous. Um, but the stigma of mental illness was still so strong, especially in the first decade or so after the asylum closed, that nobody wanted these big, beautiful buildings. They weren't really suited for industrial work, and they were far too large for a single-family dwelling. So what happened with a lot of these cottages is that the city of Bartonville just brought in wrecking balls and knocked them down. All the rubble fell into the basement, and whatever was left on top of the ground, they just picked it up by the dump truck full and dumped it into these ravines. So a lot, if, if you walk in, if you walk these, through these ravines, that was over four decades ago. And there are still places in those ravines where you can't take two steps without stepping on broken crockery. So we have collected quite a few pieces of cups, um, hairbrushes, pieces of plates, a doll's head that was once cuddled by a child, a patient, or the, the, the child of an employee. All these things are still down there. And that also serves as a very powerful attractant to the spirits. Yeah, so I sometimes I have artifacts like that on my table. I'm, I'm fortunate enough once in a while to be able to bring things like that to uh, the, the conferences. The reason I asked, Sylvia, was that a lot of times it's a lot easier for the, the ghost or the spirit to the soul to come with you if there is, it's attached to something that it knew at the time mm -hmm. it was connected to. So if it was it used a plate and you've got a piece of the plate or, you know, the hairbrush or whatever, it gets yeah. to something like that. Uh, it's very interesting. And, and when you talk about the creeks underneath a place like that, um, the amount of energy that is, that is being generated by that moving water, and then you're doing a paranormal investigation and <laughs> the things you're trying to talk to are tapping into that and being able to respond to you relatively quickly or become vis yeah. visible a lot easier because they can tap into that, uh, that energy being pulled off of that. We are talking to Sylvia Schultz. Please go to our website, sylviaschultz.com. That's Schultz, S-H-U-L-T-S, sylviaschultz.com. Kind of, uh, kind of carry on. Follow us, follow along on that, and if you want to um, uh, see what books she's got out right now, uh, please, you can find them all on her website or Amazon.com, and I'll target you who, if you've got uh, an Amazon, uh, Amazon gift certificate for Christmas, well, I'll tell you what, <laughs> we'll go to, you can check out some of her books um, uh, that are out on Amazon, Fractured Spirits, Hauntings at the Peoria State Hospital, 45 Years in Darkness, Ghosts of the Illinois River. Um, it, it's, it's tons, tons. Uh, and again, Spirits we're going to get Christmas. into... <laughs> yeah, yeah, have a Merry Christmas. Um, so that's, <laughs> it's one way to use your, uh, your Christmas um, gift from uh, your cousin who got you the Amazon gift certificate. Uh, Sylvie's written a lot of books too. If you've uh, you're not really interested in the nonfiction stuff, um, she's got a lot of fiction that'll keep you up screaming at night too. The, <laughs> the, <laughs> am I selling? And even, no, I'm not. Okay. <laughs> this is wonderful. Yes, um, yeah. an even better place to find me is sylviaschultz.wordpress.com. What you have another you yeah. little stinker. <laughs> Schultz.wordpress. Now, if we get our books from WordPress, um, do we buy them directly from you? Uh, 
Um, there are, if you go to the WordPress site and click on the book covers, that takes you straight to Amazon. Oh, so it's always going to sneak us into Amazon. You know, I usually like to send people so. to buy them I'm directly. I'm a from... card. I don't know how to set it up to go straight to me. <laughs> yeah, just put your phone number on your website. Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> oh, because that'll just end in tears. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> can only go well. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. What to... I'm just Honey, kidding. can you get I'm the phone again? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> ghostly people phoning us. Um, so you've got your, you, you get all your paranormal stuff going on. You've got uh, people going on. And I'm going to come back to it because I, I want these stories about uh, what you've run into as an actual investigator out there. Um, mm-hmm. and, and then got you digging into... George Zeller and all his stuff. Now, he wrote a book, didn't he? Um, yeah. He did. He wrote his autobiography. The, yeah. Befriending the Bereft. Briefed. Um, Befriending it, it the actually, Bereft, yes. Yeah, it, it actually talks about a bunch of um, kind of supernatural experiences he had during <laughs> uh, the time he was there. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And... Uh, <laughs> So, uh, have you ever had an opportunity to read his book, or does that can we still? Find I have, it? yes. Oh, it's no. very well written. It's a real pleasure to read. You you feel like he's sitting in a chair opposite you, and you're sharing a cup of tea, and it's just it's a really readable style. It's a great deal of fun to read. Oh, in your neighborhood, he probably really is sitting across from you uh, reading it, um, right? <laughs> yeah. So, does he actually touch on some of what we would call paranormal now? Well, yes. Yes, he does. Um, In his autobiography, there is a wonderful story about a patient at the Peoria State Hospital named Bookbinder. Now, Bookbinder came to us in um, 1906. Um, His friends dropped him off at the asylum. All anybody knew about this guy was that he had worked at a book bindery in uh, probably either Peoria or Chicago. We're not quite sure. I think it might have been Chicago. But um, he had had a mental breakdown at work. And his breakdown was so total and so complete that he could not tell the intake nurses his name. He was rendered mute. So lacking any other information about him, the intake nurses simply wrote down in the ledger, a manual bookbinder. So he became known as Bookbinder, or Old Book for short. He wasn't particularly old, he was a fairly young man. But one of Dr. Zeller's genius ideas was to give everyone who was able a job to do. Every able bodied patient had something to do, something to, a reason to get up in the morning, something to occupy the hours of their day. And it made them feel useful too, which was an amazing thing to do at an asylum. So old book was put on cemetery detail. His job was to keep the cemeteries looking nice and tidy. And he was also in charge of digging the graves. So he, he hadn't been there but just a couple of days when he was called upon to dig a grave. And he stuck around for the funeral afterwards. He didn't know this patient from anybody, but he stuck around for the funeral. And he was standing there by the grave and while the service was going on, and, and his shoulder started to hitch, and, and a, a tear tracked down his cheek, and pretty soon old book was just sobbing openly. So he didn't want to disturb the service, so he walked over to a great big elm tree that was in the middle of the cemetery and he leaned against this elm tree and just started sobbing as though his heart were going to break and when the service was over he collected himself and wiped his eyes and came back and filled in the grave now he did this dr zeller wrote that he did this for every funeral he attended and he attended every funeral that was held on the hilltop it got to be so that old book was kind of an urban legend on the hilltop. If someone knew that they were on their deathbed, they would snag a passing nurse and they would say, hey, make sure old book cries for me at my funeral or I won't get into heaven. Very superstitious lot, these mental patients. Mm-hmm. Um, so after a while, old book himself passed away. 
He passed away in 1911. He probably died from tuberculosis. Um, so his funeral was very well attended. He was really well liked at the asylum. So Dr. Zeller was there. They sang a hymn. Dr. Zeller gave a little bit of a eulogy. And the coffin was sitting on a couple of boards that were placed over the open grave. And there were ropes slung underneath the coffin. Four guys lift up the ropes. They slide the boards under and they lower the coffin into the grave. So they get ready to put old book into the ground. And the four guys are on either side of these ropes and they lift up on the ropes and the coffin just bounces up into the air as though it were completely empty. And at that very moment, everyone at the funeral heard a screaming and wailing coming from the old elm. And they looked over and there was the ghost of old book standing by the graveyard elm, just howling and carrying on and leaning against the trunk and just crying his eyes out. And Dr. Zeller wrote, he said, it was awful, but it was real. I saw it. 100 nurses and 300 spectators saw it. So Dr. Zeller walked over to this this coffin and he said, I want that coffin open right now. So a couple of, of uh, guys ran and got a, a crowbar and they, they jimmied up the coffin lid. And as soon as the coffin lid opened, the wailing stopped, the ghost vanished, and there in the coffin lay old book. He was undeniably dead. Oh, so the wow. story of old book doesn't end there. After about six weeks or so, the old elm started to die. And Dr. Zeller was a very safety-conscious guy. He didn't want the whole tree coming down and hurting somebody. So he sent out a crew to chop, chop the tree down. And at the first couple of strokes of the axe, the workmen swore they could hear screaming coming from the old, old uh, elm's trunk. And they said, oh, it's the ghost of old book. We don't want anything to do with this. And they threw their axes down. They reported back to Dr. Zeller. And uh, they said, no, no, we're not going to chop old book's tree down. So Dr. Zeller sent a fire crew out to burn the tree down. And they piled kindling all around the base of this dying tree. And they they put some kerosene on it to get the fire going. They were standing by with buckets of water for safety. And uh, they touched a match to the kindling, and the smoke started coming up from the kindling, and the crackling started as the fire caught, the crackling started. And in the crackling of the flames, they swore they could hear the voice of Old Book again. And in the smoke that came up, they could see Old Book's face and they said, oh, no, we can't destroy Old Book's tree. We can't, just can't do it. So they threw the water on and put the fire out. And the old tree was allowed to die on its own. And it did come down during a storm. And legend has it that when it finally did fall, it fell right between the rows of headstones and didn't damage a single stone as it fell. Oh, wow. That's Yeah. That that's an awesome story, right? And you tell a good one. <laughs> thank you That's a thank good you good story um it's, what? it's not true <laughs> it's it's not true oh. it's not it's not now dr zeller was a very very good writer he was known as the rudyard kipling of america and he got fan mail from the rudyard kipling of england <laughs> complimenting him on his short fiction Oh, and this story of old book made the rounds of the other asylums. And pretty soon, Dr. Zeller would go to conferences and he would have superintendents of other asylums coming up to him and going, hey, we've just heard this nutty story about some ghost at your asylum. A, what's, what's the deal with that? <laughs> so Dr. Zeller eventually fessed up. He wrote a blanket letter and sent it out to all the journals that he contributed to, including, interestingly enough, the Journal for Psychical Research, which oh, was the really? paranormal journal at the time. Yeah. And he said, you know, we have a lot of wonderful characters at our asylum. Some of them make it into my fiction. <laughs> and uh, was there a patient named Old Book? 
at the asylum? Yes, there was. Was he on cemetery duty? Yes, he was. Did he cry at every funeral? Yes, he did. He was very well known. And Dr. Zeller said he cried at every funeral. He wept so much for these people that he didn't even know sometimes. He said, I thought it was a shame that no one would cry for him. So he made it happen. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Well, good for him. <laughs> so, and good for, and good yeah. for coming forward. <laughs> <laughs> and not leaving us a hundred years later going, gee, I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> no, now, I don't know how many of your listeners know this, but Ghost Hunters was actually at the Peoria State Hospital a few years ago. They explored the Bowen Building, which was still standing at that point, and they also spent some time in Cemetery 2, which is where Old Book was buried. And they caught a shadow figure along the tree line. It's the best piece of evidence that came out of that entire episode. It's really quite something. It's really astounding. And they said, oh, this must be the ghost of old book. And that's what everyone thought for months and months and months. But I've just told you that old book, the ghost of old book, was completely made up out of whole cloth, out of Dr. Zeller's imagination. So who was this shadow figure that Shadow Hunter, that uh, Ghost Hunters caught on film? Well, this is an interesting case where the historical record can tell us about who is doing the haunting. In uh, 1906, I believe it was, we took in a patient named Charles Jones. He came from Hannah City. He was in his early 70s, and he, he voluntarily committed himself. He was feeling depressed, and he knew what was going on, and he sought help. So he came to us and had himself voluntary, voluntarily committed. And he was a pleasant old fellow. He made friends with the nurses, and he would wander around and, there were no locked doors on the hilltop except the two violent wards for men and women. Anyone could come and go as they pleased. So Mr. Jones was wandering the hilltop, and before the asylum was there, it was a coal mining operation. And the coal miners had left a lot of their equipment lying around. Charles wandered into one of these coal mines, and he found a blasting cap used to set off dynamite, and he pocketed it. And he, after he had been with us for a few weeks, he decided that he could no longer fight his demons, and he went into one of the ravines, quite possibly the ravine next to Cemetery 2, and he put the blasting cap in his mouth and either bit down on it or punched up with his fist against the bottom side of his jaw, and he blew his head off. He, oh. The newspapers say that his head was... They, they never found any scrap of his head. It was taken off as cleanly as a, a guillotine would have done. Just blew his head to bits. So, since he did that in the ravines, it is quite possible that the shadow figure that Ghost Hunters caught on film was not Bookbinder at all, but the spirit of Charles Jones. That is interesting. <laughs> you say, like, and that he would have died around 1909? Uh, I think it was 1906, but let me 1906. double check. Okay. And I think he was... He, uh, oh, I'm sorry, it was 1909, August of 1909, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, August, uh, and he was about 73, 74, 75. 73. Like so if we do the math, he could have been actually a soldier in the Civil War who was suffering from that PTSD. Possible, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, because that would, that puts him in the age range for suffering from PTSD and, and not being able to get along with a lot of normal people in the community. You would, you would book mm -hmm. yourself in or check yourself into a psych hospital yeah. because no one else understands the crap that you went through. 
Yeah. And, and like, oh, you know, and this ought to make you smile, too. Um, it is quite possible, since he was there in 1909 and killed himself in 1909, it is quite possible, in fact, very probable, that Bookbinder buried him. Oh, of course, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but not all of him. Just kidding. Well, uh, no. <laughs> most of them. See, and the other thing too, you've got a you've got a um, uh, place with again water running underneath it. You've got um, mm -hmm. ravines. You probably have a lot of stairs. Correct. Yes, yes, we do. There is a stairway that reaches. It goes through the woods. It starts on uh, Route Twenty Nine, I think it is. And there's, it goes all the way up the, the hillside to, uh, it comes out in kind of a little subdivision of Bartonville. The stairs are in very poor repair, and I do not suggest that people go and try to find these stairs because it's owned by the city of Bartonville, and they really don't want you climbing around on yeah, that. But yes, we do have sued. a lot of stairs. Yeah, yeah I, I would like it, if you haven't done this already, being... If you're, next time you're out paranormaling and doing an investigation, mm -hmm. if you could set up um, on or around those stairs, I think you would probably capture um, resi uh, residual energy of people walking up and down those stairs. Mostly walking. It's quite possible. Because of the yeah, energy the, that they put into walking up those stairs for many, many years <laughs> and imprints over time. Yes. Now, the patients were not allowed on those stairs. Those were for the, the nurses and the staff to come up and down. Yep. Actually. Yeah, still. That's, as long as you were exerting yourself to go up a set of stairs and you were doing it every day, um, <laughs> you find that you kind of do an imprint on those. Um, I can't it's, help it's it. fascinating. And I'm really glad that uh, a television series actually got a, uh, a shadow figure, a figure. Um, but, you know, I know the guys from TAPS, so <laughs> they're actually pretty good at that. <laughs> Compared to another television show that's been on for quite a while, and I'm yet to see them ever get a picture of a ghost, but we won't get into who those guys are. Right. Um, and why a flat-brimmed ball cap is uh, somehow trendy. Anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, how many pictures of ghosts have you ever captured? Uh, More than one? I... I don't tend to get good um, photo captures. Um, I think I may have caught kind of a smear of mist when I went to the Watsika Wonder House, the Roth House in Watsika. But uh, 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 yeah, I, I'm kind of ready to debunk that. Um, I am pretty good at capturing EVPs. Yeah, they're very I have very caught good. a couple of, yeah. I went out with that. And that's what I love. I mean, ghost photos, sometimes they're a little nebulous. I mean, you can say, oh, hey, that's an orb, and I tend to discount orb photos. Or, oh, it's a smear of light, and oh, that's wonderful, but it's very rare and wonderful and exciting to capture a full body apparition, but it, I, I've never been able to capture something like that but when you're you're talking and you hear a voice on the recorder that you know wasn't there that's exciting that is kind of cool i, I belong to a paranormal <laughs> group and um i think anytime we were at a very very haunted location we'd come out with a full body picture or a head oh. you know i've got floating oh, heads coming up to me on a stage uh -huh. with my iphone <laughs> Just randomly <laughs> taking pictures in a movie theater from the stage, and I've got this woman uh -huh. floating, and it was like, yeah. And someone says, well, <laughs> no, it's dust. I, yeah, right. <laughs> you can yeah. see her nose, her <laughs> mouth, her eyes, her hair, and it was with an iPhone, and it was dark. Yeah. So, and I, one of the guys I used to be with, he's, he had a camera that would freaking take pictures. He, had, he was taking pictures of an office space. Uh, mm -hmm. it, what, what is now a restaurant, incredibly active restaurant. And uh, mm -hmm. he was taking a picture of the office and somebody came out of that pushing a hand truck, a little cart, mm -hmm. towards him and walked right through him. And he has a picture of him coming <laughs> out around the corner and walking through him. Now, it wasn't a, it was residual energy. It was kind of inflated. It was a lot bigger than a normal person would be. And most mm -hmm. likely just because that guy had been hauling stuff from that room over many years over time. 
he just imprinted right there and he just happened to catch him coming around the corner right at him. Mm -hmm. It's like, ah, and, and that happened right as I was having a conversation with a disembodied woman in the other room. And I came at my second <laughs> investigation saying, I think you need a nice. skeptic because I'm just talking to this lady over here and he says, oh, look at this. And I went, okay, uh, I think I'll leave. But that was, <laughs> he kept that. we got him all the time. Oh, wow. I watched, I watched some TV shows that have been all again for 10 years and not get a picture of a ghost. And I'm thinking, yeah. how can we get them all the time? Uh, yeah, it's kind of freaky. We, again, we're talking to yeah. uh, Sylvia Schultz. She's an author of a number of stories. Um, one of which is when we're talking about the fractured spirits, uh, which are hauntings at the Peoria, Peoria State. I'm having problems saying Peoria uh, State Hospital. <laughs> um, we've, we've touched a little bit about the different things that have gone on there. Uh, we've touched on the history of the hospital itself. and. Uh, all the, the kind of the cool people that were involved in it right from the, the beginning, Dr. Zeller and, uh, and some of some of the hauntings, some of the ghosts that he pretended mm -hmm. to write about. Uh, the, the, and, uh, <laughs> and what I'd like to do, one of the books you have, uh, and that's one book, but the other one of the books you have is 44 Years in Darkness. Now, we've been saying that yeah. uh, this is a really nice place to be, yeah, and it's, you know, as far as a mental hospital or a psychiatric hospital, it's it's actually it was uh, beyond its uh, years in 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 advancing uh, good good health for its patients. There was a patient mm -hmm. in there that was a little bit um, uh, broken severely. Yeah. Her name is uh, yes, Ms. absolutely. Yeah, Can you tell us a little bit about uh, Rhonda. I think her name is Rhonda Deary. Rhoda. Rhoda, Rhoda Dairy. Rhoda, okay. Rhoda Dairy, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, the story of Rhoda Dairy is one of the great tragedies of mental health care in Illinois, and it's one of the great success stories of the Peoria State Hospital. Rhoda uh, grew up in southern Illinois in Adams County, down by Quincy. She was born in 1834, and she was a beautiful, beautiful young girl. Uh, she was the youngest of nine children. Um, very pretty, pretty little girl. Um, when she was 16 years old, she did the most natural thing in the world. She fell in love. There was a family in the uh, a, a neighboring town, and she, she met Charles Phoenix and fell in love with him. Um, he was also 16 years old, and uh, she, we, we don't know how far their relationship went, but we do know that after they'd been courting for a couple of years, Charles asked Rhoda to marry him, and she said yes. Now, there was one person that was very much against this relationship, and that was Nancy Phoenix, Charles's mother. Now, I mentioned that Rhoda was the youngest of nine children. The Jerry's were very, very poor. The census records, records show Jacob Derry, the father of the household, working as a tenant farmer for most of his life. They didn't even have land to call their own. The Phoenixes, on the other hand, were very well off, especially for the frontier days. Um, Charles was the older son of only four children. So he stood to inherit his father's land after Frederick passed on. So Nancy Phoenix was not about to have her baby boy Charles marry one of these dirt poor dairies. So she confronted Rhoda in the street. And she said, if you do not release my son from this engagement, I will curse you. Now, talking about witchcraft in front of Rhoda Dairy was a really good way to get her attention very, very quickly. Rhoda's grandmother, Mal Derry, was known as the fortune teller of the revolution. She had emigrated with her husband, Valentine, who was conscripted by the British to fight as a Hessian soldier in the Revolutionary War. Mal disguised herself as a man. When they got to the colonies, Valentine and Molly switched sides and fought with the colonists against the British. 
And after the war, it settled in Pennsylvania, and Moll became a practitioner of Pennsylvania Dutch hex magic. She was known for counties around as being able to lift and cast curses. So talking about witchcraft in front of Moll Derry's granddaughter, Rhoda, really would have gotten her attention very quickly. A few weeks after this confrontation with Nancy Phoenix, Rhoda had some sort of break with consensual reality. She started acting very strangely. She swore that the devil was out to get her. Old Scratch was after her. She swore that invisible witches were swooping down from the corners of the cabin and attacking her. Now, Rachel Derry, her mother, was about the only person that even tried to understand what young Rhoda was going through. So when Rhoda would start having these fits, attacking, you know, being attacked by invisible witches, Rachel would whip out a pistol out of her apron pocket and start firing it around the cabin to drive the witches away. Not sure how helpful that was. <laughs> Mm-hmm. But uh, she she was doing it with the best of intentions. Um, the heart wrenching thing about this part of Rhoda's story is that these are small towns that the Dairies and the Phoenixes lived in. Word travels fast. Nancy Phoenix realized very quickly that she had made a horrible mistake and really affected this young girl's life. And she went to the dairy cabin to try and talk to Rhoda. And she tried to get in to see her to say, you're fine. There is no curse. I, I, it's all in your head. You're, you're really okay. Snap out of it. And Rhoda refused to see her, and I don't blame her a bit. Um, after a couple of years of this, Rhoda was put, was committed to the county hospital, the uh, insane asylum at Jacksonville, Illinois. She was there for two years. Um, She was released after two years as being incurably insane. The strange part about this part of Rhoda's story is that she, she was a very violent patient. She was kept in a locked ward. She was locked in her room every night. And every morning, the attendants would find her wandering the grounds, calling out for Charles. And the attendants would always escort her back to her room and say, who let you out? And Rhoda's answer was always the same. Nancy Phoenix let me out. That's something that no one's ever been able to explain. I have my own theory, but no one's ever been able to explain that. So Rhoda was released as incurable from Jacksonville after two years. Her family cared for her at home as long as they could, but in 1860, her mother died. And her father could no longer care for her at home. She was still very violent. So he made the heart-wrenching decision to have her committed to the Adams County Alms House. Now... As I just mentioned, in Jacksonville, there was a lunatic asylum there, and there were also private asylums. But if you had $25 for a license and an empty barn in your backyard, you could open up your own almshouse. They didn't think that the mentally ill could feel heat or cold or hunger. So almshouses in the mid-19th century were often really horrible places. The Adams County Almshouse was not that bad. It was a county-run poor farm, so it had county oversight. And it was really a nice little place. It was situated next to a creek and with rolling hills to look at. But the sad fact is that a poor house or an almshouse or a poor farm is somewhere where if you're down on your luck, you can go and get three hots in a cot. They're not prepared to care for the mentally ill. But poor people go crazy, too. It's just a fact of life. And the people, the staff at the Adams County Alms House were absolutely unprepared for someone with Rhoda's depth of crazy. She was really badly off. She thought she was cursed. Her mother had died. 
she was abandoned by her family. Her father drove her up to the Adams County Almshouse and dropped her off. She never saw him again. She, her fiancé was who knows where at this point. So she started acting out. She was still very violent. She developed a condition called pica, which is a compulsion to eat inappropriate objects. She would lunge at people and try to pick the buttons off their shirt or off their blouse and put them in her mouth. She would crawl around, around on the floor, and whatever she found on the floor, a pin, a penny, a nail, it would go straight into her mouth. If you gave her a piece of chicken for her dinner, she would just cram it into her mouth, bones and all. So in order to keep her safe and so that she wouldn't bother other of the poorhouse inmates, the superintendent of the Adams County Poorhouse basically told his staff to put Rhoda in something called a Utica crib. It's what it sounds like. It looks like a baby's crib, sits on the floor, and it also has a barred top, which locks. The Utica crib was never designed for use longer than overnight. It was standard issue in lunatic asylums of the day. But people were not supposed to be left in it any longer than overnight. The Utica crib in most asylums was lined with a thin hospital mattress. Rhoda's crib was lined with straw. The mice would scurry over her. There was a strategically cut hole at hip level and a tray underneath to catch the waste. She was left in there for months at a time. When she was let out, her hips had atrophied from being curled up in a fetal position for weeks and months on end. When she was let out, she could no longer stand on her own. Sometime in the, ten, the first 10 years of this treatment, Rhoda decided that she no longer wanted to watch the world go by through the bars of the cage, and she clawed her own eyes out. Yeah. She spent decades in this situation. Now, in 1902, the Peoria State Hospital opened. And one of Dr. Zeller's bedrock tenets was that he believed that everyone deserved a chance. He believed that no one was incurable. When the asylum opened, it was called the Illinois Hospital for the Incurable Insane. He got the name changed. He said, do not tell my patients they're incurable. That's what I'm here to do. He felt that it was his mandate to care for the worst of the worst. That doesn't mean violent patients. That means the people that are abused and mistreated. That's what he meant by the worst of the worst. So how do you prove that? How do you prove that no one is beyond salvation? No one is beyond help? Well, you go around to the almshouses and the poorhouses of the state, and you find the most wretched, abused, maltreated cases, and you bring them to your hospital. And that's exactly what Dr. Zeller did. He went on a tour of the almshouses of the state, and he came to the Adams County Almshouse, and he found Rhoda there. She had been moved to a box bed by that point. She was no longer in the Utica crib, but she was still lying helpless, unable to stand, unable to walk. She was lying in this box bed with this thin sheet of canvas covering her. Dr. Zeller took one look at Rhoda Derry, and she, he, he said, this patient is coming with me. And the superintendent of the almshouse didn't want to let Rhoda go because he figured that the almshouse was going to be blamed for her condition. Yeah, go figure. And Dr. Zeller said, this patient comes with me, or I shut your institution down effective immediately. September 26, 1904. There had been a storm earlier that day. There was a washout on the tracks. So the train from Quincy to Bartonville got in very late that night. It was about 1 o'clock in the morning that the nurses and the attendants got the call that the train had finally arrived on the hilltop. So they went to meet the train. 
And the, the patients from Adams County, about 60 of them, were being transported on boxcars. So the attendants and nurses gently led these patients off of the boxcars and they made them stand on the on the platform on the train station and they stood there shivering in the early e- evening or the early September cold and a couple of the attendants went on to one of the box cars just to make sure that no one had been left behind and at one end of the box car they saw this great big wicker laundry basket and that was unusual because the patients usually arrived at the asylum, wearing only the clothes on their backs. It was very strange, unusual to uh, send patient clothing along. But the attendant said, well, um, first time for everything, I guess. So they pick up this laundry basket, one guy on either end of this big laundry basket, and they hump it off of the boxcar, and they plop it down on the station flat platform. And all of a sudden, the lid of the basket lifts, the clothes part, and there sat Rhoda in amongst the laundry, jabbering at people. She was being transported in in a basket because her hips had atrophied so badly that she couldn't sit in a chair for any length of time. That night, for the first time in 44 years, Rhoda Derry slept in a bed with clean white sheets. The nurses quickly discovered her, they they realized that she would be the daughter of the institution. They waited on her hand and foot from that moment on. They knew her excruciating history, and the nurses decided that Rhoda should experience the hilltop in any way that was left to her. She could no longer see, of course, but they let her sit out in the gardens and feel the sun on her face and smell the flowers whose colors she could no longer see and listen to the birds singing. They took her to dances so that she could enjoy the music. So they they waited on her absolutely hand and foot, and they were happy to do it. They knew what she'd been through for the past 44 years, and they just dropped everything to wait on this wretched patient. And she could no longer see, but she was absolutely aware whenever Dr. Zeller came into the room. I don't know if she heard his voice or smelled his cologne. I don't know what it was, but whenever Dr. Zeller entered a room where Rhoda Derry was, she lit up. She knew that he was her savior. She was with us for a couple of years. Um, She probably developed tuberculosis in the almshouse. And by the summer of 1906, her case became full-blown. So she was moved from her cottage to Dining Hall A, which had been pressed into service as a tuberculosis ward. And that is where she passed away, October 9th, 1906, the day before she would have turned 72 years old. Wow. And do you know much about her um, physical change going from, you know, the atrophied legs and and in in those last two or three years? Um, Was she eating? Well, she... did, did, did she was her. definitely eating better, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, well now, this is, this is interesting. Um, she, she never regained the use of her legs. She okay. never regained the use of, her, of, of speech. Um, it is quite possible that she was missing her tongue. It is very possible that while she was still crawling around on the floor, she put something into her mouth that lacerated her tongue and turned it gangrenous. So um, she was not able to speak. She never spoke at the asylum. She never walked at the asylum. Um, But uh, I have spoken with people who have seen Rhoda's spirit. And they have very... I've spoken with several people, and they have very interesting, different takes on this. Um, One person 
was, I think she was in Dining Hall A at some point, because that building is still standing. And she told me that she saw Rhoda there, and Rhoda was a tall girl. And this person saw Rhoda in spirit, and she, she said that she had very spidery limbs, very long limbs that reached out for her. And if you're not used to Rhoda's ghost lore, and not, mm. if you're not used to her history and didn't know that she was very tall, I mean, she's still got long legs, even though she can't use them, and she's still got very long arms. So she looks rather, rather intimidating <laughs> when you see her in spirit. Um, the other thing that the same person told me is that uh, she saw Rhoda when, when she was very young, when the paraprecipient was very young, and her first thought was that she was seeing Glenda the Good Witch because Rhoda presented herself in a bubble. Now, you and I have done ghost hunting before, and we know that the spirits often present themselves the way they see themselves in life. Well, Rhoda would not have known anything about the hilltop except that rolling sensation of being pushed around in a wheelchair by these nurses. So that's how she presents herself in this rolling format, which I thought was very, very interesting. Now, the best story I heard about someone seeing Rhoda was that uh, she was in the Pollock Hospital and Rhoda loved that entire hilltop so much. She, she can be sensed and felt and seen anywhere on the hilltop. So uh, this friend of mine, Liz, is a psychic medium. And she saw Rhoda sitting there on the floor. And she said she presented herself as with kind of a blue hinge to her. And she knew that it was Rhoda because she had heard the story um, several times by that point. And she kind of, she, she stood up and presented herself as Liz said to me, she said, if you see a, a very lovely looking Victorian lady around the grounds, ask her what her name is. And I, I said, you know, Liz, most of us will never have the opportunity to see a proper Victorian lady wandering the ground. How are we supposed to know? And she, she was able to, she said she looked at me with very kind eyes. And she knew, she realized that that was Rhoda. And there was another woman, also a psychic medium, who was at the Peoria State Hospital for a two-day investigation. Both Liz and Lisa were there for a two-day investigation. And I helped, I, I tagged along on this investigation, so I got to hear all these stories. So they, were, they started on Friday night, and I told Rhoda's story several times during the Friday night investigation. And Lisa just kept mulling this over in her mind. She kept thinking about it and thinking about it and dwelling on it. And she said to herself, oh, that is so unfair that this person, Rhoda, suffered so badly in life and she's still reduced to crawling around on the floor in the afterlife because that's part of Rhoda's ghost lore is if you feel a tugging on your pants leg, that's Rhoda letting you know that she's there. And Lisa felt a tugging on her pants leg Friday night. And she spoke up and reported it. And the guide at the Pollock Hospital said, oh, yeah, that's, that's undoubtedly Rhoda. So Lisa was just stewing about this all day on Saturday. So the group gets to the Pollock Hospital for the second night of investigation on Saturday evening. And they hadn't been there but five minutes when Lisa was in the hallway very close to where Liz saw Rhoda. And Lisa said she looked down and she saw Rhoda Derry sitting there on the floor. And she said that Rhoda looked up at her, smiled, and then got to her knees and then got to her feet and stood up tall and proud and just sort of gestured to herself as if to say, See, I'm whole. 
I'm happy. I'm on the other side and I've been healed. I can walk now. And see. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's the so good I'm, thing that I wanted to hear. I wanted to hear that people had seen her what she looked like when she crossed and then came oh, back. Oh yeah. As opposed to seeing her not crossed and perceiving herself still trapped in that body. No, she is she is healthy and beautiful and she deserves to spend eternity young and beautiful. <laughs> oh, that's great. Sylvia, that is, it's fantastic that um, we've had an opportunity to catch up on that. That is, it, it's, it's beautiful to hear. And I know from all the years I've been interviewing people who talk to the dead and have seen the dead and, and um, those who have crossed over, uh, I know that when they, they can come and when, when they show up at a location um, like the Peoria Hospital, when she's there, it's, 1906 and the music is playing and all her friends are there and the nurses are there and she's in a working body and she's Mm -hmm. happy with that group and she's not trapped in curled up and in a broken uh a broken body and just a ghost uh aimlessly (laughs) what's i should say walking but just laying there moaning yeah, it's, um, yeah. It, it's good that she she has crossed and decided to come back and experience a little bit more with her friends before she moves on to whatever it is more that we do after uh right. experiencing this absolutely fascinating thank you very much that was i a am good story. so grateful oh sure i'm so grateful that liz and lisa shared those experiences with me and and i'm so grateful that Rhoda has found that existence, that she has a, a beautiful working body now, even in spirit. I, I'm glad she's happy now. Yeah. She went through so much, and I'm so pleased that she's found peace and contentment. What do you think happens to us when we die? From everything that I have read and experienced what I've heard from spirits with the help of psychic mediums. Um, I believe that we go somewhere else. You can call it the summerland. You can call it heaven. It's just a different plane of existence. And I believe that we rest there for a while. I believe that we see loved ones that have we reunite with loved ones that have passed before us. I believe that they come to us as we're dying and guide us to this other plane of existence. And I think we just get to rest for a while and maybe teach others and care for others until we return to life in another body and have another experience. I really yeah. firmly believe that with all of my, fi- every fiber of my being. Yeah, me too. I've, I've got into, I've, uh, you know, I, I, I should say I kind of I got that belief going when I was a kid and I actually saw full on apparitions of dead people. Like they were mm. normal living people. And then that kind of faded away wow. until a few years ago. Uh, because we kind of file that. I always say we build a wall made out of science and religion. We have this yeah, blockage yeah. We, we put, we self-impose on ourselves. And it cleared up a bit, and luckily I don't get the full-on um, solid apparitions anymore, other than the one I brought home from a paranormal investigation who was standing at the foot of my bed, which is a whole other you issue. You say luckily, the, um, why is that? Yeah, well, it's because he he missed his family, and I had a family, and he sh- and I didn't uh-huh. clear myself before I left because ah. I was tired and it was raining and it was a long drive, and I got home and then opened <laughs> he was standing yeah. in my bed. But um, yeah, so then why that, do you, why do you say that? Luckily, you don't see them anymore. Um, it's I never have been able to see them, and I, I mean, not in my house or anything, but. It would be really fascinating to know, I mean, 
I believe it for a hundred percent certain, but it would be nice to see something a hundred percent certain, you know? Well, so please, uh, wh why do you say that's here, luckily that you don't see them here, anymore? Here's, here's the difference between seeing them and seeing them. Like when I, when I'm doing what I call a stand up reading and someone is standing in front of me and I see a loved one who is kind of their guide or they're in between mm -hmm. their spirit guidance and them standing beside them. Um, mm -hmm. If you could picture somebody you went to high school with in your head right now, mm -hmm. um, you don't see them from the waist down and their clothing might change because you're okay. putting a compilation of a th years of friendship together or for years of knowing this person together into one picture. And so it's okay. not that clear. And that's how, that's the only way I can see, that's how I explained seeing people like that, standing beside somebody. Hmm. So it's almost like a memory. I, I can, I can ah. see it as a memory and I'm describing the, uh, somebody from my memory and I'm building them from the head to the toe. And they're, it, while I'm doing this, they're, they're giving, in my case, they give me hand signals or show me something and they're trying to, it's called, ah. I think I've been called an evidential medium where, where um, the person I'm talking to needs evidence to prove that I'm not blowing smoke up their ass, basically. <laughs> it's like, uh -huh. I'm not making this stuff up. <laughs> and like, uh -huh. I had a, a lady the other day come through for, a guy said, hey, you did this to a friend of mine and you know, do you think you could do it for me? And I looked at him and said, uh -huh. oh, okay, just give me, give me a second. Cause it was, it wasn't like she wanted to come through to talk to him. She, he asked and his grandmother mm -hmm. came through and I said, you've got, she's showing me. And I was holding on to my left pinky, turning it. Mm -hmm. Like I had a ring on. I said, do you have like a little gold ring that she gave you? And he just looked oh. at me and just went, uh, yeah, well, she gave me that at my christening or something when I was a kid and I still have that. And I said, yeah, and I oh. described her, and I said, I described her totally. He says, yeah, I was kind of thinking, I didn't know it was going to be my grandmother with me. I always thought it was my dad or my grandfather. And I said, well, your grandfather just stepped in. He's wearing a white hat with a black band on it, and he, I totally floored the guy. <laughs> but oh, because, wow. So that's evidence of something that I would never know, but he totally mm -hmm. understood it all. Um, but to me, and I've learned that I just have to say it out loud because a lot of times if I don't, if I can't like, um, like the lady who's standing beside you in the white outfit, I said, well, it's like a uniform. It's just, it's all white and it's like, it's a top and bottom kind of thing. Um, okay. sometimes I remember when I first started doing this, I wouldn't mention what they were wearing or mm. I wouldn't mention the length of their hair or the perceived color, even though I don't see color. I get the words mm. for color in my head. I don't know if that makes okay. sense at all. Or they'll yeah. a hand signal. And there's a number of hand signals, which means you're on path or you need to do this or you need to do that or you need to let go and think, Ooh. you know, whatever the message is. So they originally were coming through to me because they had messages to give the person I was talking to. Um, mm -hmm. It's been very, it's been very new to me where someone comes up and says, can you see who's standing beside me? I would like to know something. Mm. And then I take a deep breath and I go, oh, this is weird. Because, yeah, there's <laughs> this person, there's two people behind them. And then, like we, like we talked off air about the car length away being a, a deity or a, a spirit guide or a ET and things coming through. So, there's a whole other mm -hmm. stuff I'm learning to deal with. So, there's that mm. kind of picture of a, of a person who's deceased compared to, I was in a car accident when I was a kid. And... Mm the fellow driving the other car gets out of the back of the ambulance at the hospital with his son. His son looked fine, but I found out later from my parents, his son had died. And I thought, oh my God, he must oh. have had really bad internal injuries because he looked fine when I saw him. My parents are giving me the like stare and I'm like, what? Because he had died in the car. Oh. But I was looking at him like I would be looking at a person standing in front of me. It wasn't, it, I, I could walk up and, I could imagine, you know, it's like a person. It's, there's no, you can't see through them. It's just a normal person standing there. And that's what I mean, uh -huh. the difference in seeing them. Like the guy standing at the foot of my bed was a guy standing at the foot of my bed. There was no looking through the guy. There was no, he wasn't glowing. Mm. He wasn't woo-woo at all. It was a guy standing at the foot of my bed. Um, a Chinese carpenter from the 1930s. Looking over uh -huh. my left shoulder with the most terrified look on his face. Because my understanding, that's where my mother stands, who's passed. My mother is standing over my shoulder, probably looking at him going, what the f 
are you doing here? So he had this look on his face like, well, sorry. So we had to kind of we moved him off the next day. But he had been seen, and we found out this later, he had been seen 20 years earlier by a six-year-old who he had helped up the stairs in this building that we were in. And oh. she described him totally, and I, it was the guy that I saw. So she's now 26, and she said, oh, yeah, this is, I've, you know, when I was a kid, this guy helped me up the building. He was blah, blah, blah. He looked like this. Well, I didn't know that th that day, nor did I know that when I got home. But in going back, after the investigation, do a subsequent investigation, interviewed a few people, and without telling them what I had brought home, they said, oh, you know, mm -hmm. this guy looks like this. He wears a leather apron. He was a carpenter. It was about 1935. Okay, and he told the young girl uh, when she was six that he was he was building a toy for his daughter. So Aww. a psychic friend who helped cross him said that, oh no, he he was there because he needed to finish. He didn't cross because he was still working on this toy. Oh man! And I had small daughters, or uh, they'd be early teens at the time. So he, yeah, I'm gonna come home with you. And because you know, I don't have any kids and, you know, it just, it all just was kind of this perfect storm. So what I'm saying is if you are doing a listener, if you're doing a paranormal investigation, I don't care if it's raining, snowing or sleeting and you're really tired, take a moment and just put out the intention that you're not going to take anyone home with you. <laughs> yeah. not, thank you for talking to me. Everything's okay. But if you're happy to stay here, I really don't want you to come home with me. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're not invited home with me. Just put that out yeah. there. There are some people, like I, I see there was a team I was um, working with one day, and they, had a, they all had these little cards with a prayer on it. And they, uh -huh. you know, just read that prayer to themselves as they were walking out of the car, which basically mm -hmm. was clearing themselves from anybody, any attachments, because a lot of the times you want to be open when you're in a location like that. And which is kind of freaky because you do open yourself up to a whole other side of things that we are going to talk about um, oh, yeah. next time you drop in about more of the dark energies that exist out there. And uh, oh yeah, and, uh, which is a whole other book that you have. So we want to mm -hmm. talk about that. And what is that book called? It is called Hunting Demons. Hunting Demons. Sylvia yeah. Schultz, Hunting Demons. Go drop by her websites again. She has, well, she threw one out at me. Uh, Sylvia Schultz dot WordPress dot com. Um, go through that. It's got lots of links to her books. And oh, go visit her on Facebook. Sylvia Schultz, Fractured Spirits. You have a big poster there. It says uh, Fractured Spirits. That's Schultz, S H U L T S. And it's yes. really, really nice to catch up to you with you again. And uh, we kind of covered, we just, this and, and listener, we really briefly covered three books. We covered <laughs> Fractured Spirits, Hauntings at the Peoria State Hospital. We covered mm -hmm. uh, the 44 Years in Darkness uh, about Rhoda Deary. And we mm -hmm. touched briefly on the newest book, uh, Fractured Souls. And that's Fractured Souls. That came out in September, didn't it? And that's Fractured Souls of yes, the did. Peoria State mm -hmm. Hospital. Yeah. Yeah. All that can be found uh, through her website at Sylvia Schultz, WordPress dot, dot WordPress dot com. Um, bounce around on the internet. Or just Google one of those. Google Sylvia Schultz author and you'll find them too. Uh, all available yeah. on Amazon. If you've got your Amazon card for Christmas from your loved one, um, you can find them on Kindle through Amazon and uh, buy the book and yeah i really and recommend actually, it actually oh, thank you 44 years in darkness is actually available as an audio book as well oh see and those are the best books for me yeah. <laughs> um, i i am such an audio visual kind of person if it doesn't have a thousand photos in it if it's all <laughs> words oh my gosh yeah um <laughs> yeah so audiobook is, is great those are, those are great. And uh, if, yeah. if you live in Illinois, this is uh, right up your alley. This is your history. Um, if you mm -hmm. want to read a little bit more about it, um, please, you've got to dig around a bit and find out a little bit more about where you live. Peoria State Hospital. Fascinating place. And I'm so glad you dropped by. And I'm happy for you that you actually live near a place like that, Sylvia. 
<laughs> Thank you, James. It's a real pleasure to share that history with people. And we're going to talk to you soon. We'll set up something for to talk about our demons and our uh, the darker side of paranormal work coming up. Thanks again, Sylvia. Thanks for... That's it. Let's roll. And hey, 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 hey! Let's be careful out there. Far over the snow